Federal enforcement and the police power of the state are absolutely fundamental towards protecting public health, safety, and welfare. It's also critical in terms of preserving and advancing the rule of law. The power to regulate and the power to enforce are so fundamental to our system. Yet, what happens when these powers run off the rails, when it becomes less about protecting the public good and more about using it as a blunt instrument to advance political gain, to dictate new rules and procedures and laws that Congress or state legislators should do, or if it's used as simply a method to generate revenue, and shall I say a lot of revenue, for the public fisc. These were probably the overarching concerns that prompted the feudal barons in England to revolt against King John, and it's not the King John that we heard about from John Stossel up in Texas. And it ultimately resulted in the Magna Carta that we heard about earlier this morning. And perhaps it's the real reason that Luke, Han, Leia, and Chewie fought back against the evil empire. <laughs> now we have a system of federal and state courts that are there to test these theories of enforcement, to constrain executive overreach, over enforcement, unprincipled prosecution, however, however you want to call it, it's a function that our courts should play. But when these actions result in deferred prosecution agreements, corporate integrity agreements, or settlements that never see the inside of a courtroom, you have to ask yourself, is the system really working? Over the course of the next 50 minutes, we're gonna hear from an esteemed group of panelists, many of these attorneys who you know. I'm not gonna beleaguer the introductions, but I will just start with Andy Pincus from Mayor Brown. Andy is a talented and brilliant lawyer, appellate lawyer, trial tactician, true believer in legal reform, and a thought leader when it comes to enforcement policies here in Washington, as well as all throughout the country. Next to Andy, we have Professor Victor Schwartz. Professor Schwartz is at the firm Shook, Hardy, and Bacon. He is a thought leader as well when it comes to the development of tort law jurisprudence in this country. He's well respected in academic circles as well as in the legal profession. And I will have to say, does one heck of a mean impersonation of my former boss, Arlen Specter. That's true, Harold, I do. <laughs> that just sent a chill up my spine. Last but not least, we have Paul Clement, former United States Solicitor General with Bancroft Group here in DC. Paul is also an incredible appellate litigator. He's probably argued, what, 40, 50, I probably can't even count as much in that high, the number of cases he's argued before the Supreme Court. Paul has a unique ability to really simplify and explain complex issues of constitutional law. And someone who is also a very true friend to the legal reform movement. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our panelists today. Andy, I'm gonna start with you. You've uh, obviously spent a lot of time here in Washington. You've represented clients amongst the various federal agencies. And when we talk about regulators gone rogue and the excessive, excesses of enforcement, um, specifically here in Washington, what are you seeing? Well, I, I think there are a couple of characteristics. Uh, you know, my favorite analogy in this area is uh, it, it's like a kid's soccer game enforcement today. Uh, it, everybody wants to, on the field wants to be where the ball is. Uh, so you don't just have one regulator, uh, maybe one federal regular later in one state regulator going after you. If the case is sexy and it's gonna get some headlines, you'll have four or five regulators plus the prosecutors on the federal level. You'll have a whole bunch of state AGs. You may have state agencies. You'll have plaintiff's lawyers. There's this swarm mentality that it's something that I don't think we've seen before uh, that really imposes incredible burdens on uh, the company or companies that happen to be the target. Well, if you were to identify the top five worst offenders when it comes to the federal agencies, who would they be? Well, let me, let me add one more ingredient before I get to that, because I think the other problem that we see is uh, 
the pressure that the swarm brings, or even that individual agencies can bring, makes it impossible for companies, at least, to fight in court. They just, the brand damage, in today's world, the amount of journalistic and media resources devoted to showing people beating up on companies are huge, and as everybody in the room knows better than I do, uh, that just forces CEOs to make tough decisions to get out of the bullseye one way or another and give the government what they want. And uh, so I think we have a swarm, we have incredible uh, burdens on companies that lead to this incredible coercive pressure to settle. And if you had to look at agencies today that play that game, I, I would have to, because I spend a lot of time thinking about them, put the CFPB at the top of the list. I mean, the CFPB basically uh, is an agency that has little accountability. Uh, its appropriations are off budget. It has a single director who can't be removed except for cause. Uh, and, and so it has $660 million that it's using to target companies and basically brand them as anti-consumer uh, if they won't give the CFPB what it wants. So I, I think you've got to put them up there. I think you have to put the SEC, which has really gotten a lot of publicity lately, both because of its uh, sort of sneaky and abusive use of its own administrative law judges to avoid uh, having to prove cases in court, but also you know, one example of an agency whose legal theory, both its legal theory and the legal theory of the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office was actually tested in court and they lost. And the Supreme Court wouldn't grant review and as a result of that, people who were convicted under a made up theory that you can't find any, anywhere in the U.S. Code uh, are gonna have their convictions reversed as they should. Well, Andy, we're headed into a presidential election year next year, and with many outgoing administrations, there's always a considerable amount of regulatory activity as, as that administration winds down. It was certainly um, the case in previous administrations. Do you foresee that happening again? And if so, in what, under what terms? I, I think we, we know that it's happening. Uh, I think we've certainly seen uh, the aggression at the Justice Department and the enforcement area go up in terms of the demands to settle cases because there was a desire for Attorney General Holder wanted to say, I've left office by solving all the bank problems and so incredible pressure on the banks there. I think that's continuing with the few cases that aren't resolved, but, but let's just tick off the, the EPA regulations that recently came out, both the clean water and the pollution regulations. Uh, the D Department of Labor working on this unprecedented fiduciary duty rule that's scheduled to come out before the end of the administration, and the CFPB working on a rule to effectively ban pre-dispute arbitration. They've cleverly focused it in a way so they can say, oh, we're not banning it, we're just saying that class actions can proceed alongside of uh, arbitration, which means no sane company would have an arbitration clause. But all of those things are on track to be completed uh, before the president leaves, leaves office. And I'm sure there are many, many more that we don't even know about. Uh, Professor Schwartz, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what's happening in the states, specifically with the use of state unfair trade and deceptive practices laws uh, by those in the state attorney's general community. I'm, I'm going to throw you a little bit of a curveball here. I'd like for you to do it as the ghost of Bill Clinton. Look, the unfair practices and deceptive practices, I've never done both. I did not do both. Maybe unfair, maybe deceptive, but I did not do both, nor did Hillary. Uh, let me mention first something with, uh, that Andy mentioned, and I'll answer your question. The action of the Consumer Financial uh, Protection Board and other agencies is driven in part by trial lawyers in an unprecedented way getting into federal agencies. And it's rare that uh, the, the ILR and ATRA got together behind a report they did. It's available, and if you want to read something that is not on the newspapers, Stossel didn't mention it, it's the trial lawyer underground because it is driving policy at the federal level, and in the next months, while the president is in his office, it's going to be unprecedented. And the ILR has done more to publicize this so that people know about it, so you may want to take a look at it. UDAP's at the state level. One thing contingency fee lawyers cannot do at the federal level is get hired. They can't be. There's an executive order by George Bush that still exists, and it prohibits it. But at the state level, state attorney generals can hire plaintiff's lawyers, 
and they help drive UDEPs. They help define what's unfair and what's deceptive. And those are things that they believe will earn the money. So instead of independent action, which you want from an elected state official, in some states, states you don't have that. And the way they are written, it is very different than the Federal Trade Commission, which is federal. Federal Trade Commission has to give you notice. If you say, you're fine, you didn't do anything wrong, they have to get a cease and desist order, and it takes a long time, and the amount of fines are limited. At the state level, with UDEPs, the fines are unlimited. Every sale of one uh, prescription can add another 5,000 to 10,000 to a fine. There's no notice. They can go after you without any notice whatsoever. You can be in complete control of meeting regulated standards, FDA standards, for example. But the state attorney generals can say the heck with that and go after you. And then when they get the money, a lot of them keep it. One of the state attorney generals, and I'll just conclude with this, took money from companies and bought keychains and souvenirs with his name on it and gave it out on election day. So as compared to the federal government, in some of the states, unfair and deceptive practices is a circus run wild. Well, Paul, uh, you've done some research for us regarding some of the constitutional principles that might apply here regarding some of the overreach, specifically in the area of these astronomical fines, which really seems to be affecting so many different segments, whether it's the life sciences field, the financial services institutions. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of your analysis and your findings with respect to the research that we're releasing today. Oh, Harold, I'd love to. And you know, one of the things that, as an appellate lawyer, you really don't get to use props much. So I, I really want to use this prop and show you that this is available uh, outside. And it's the uh, new publication that uh, is being released called Constitutional Constraints. <clears throat> and as Harold alluded to, it really gets to this question of, with all of these uh, various phenomena going on, the question naturally is, are there constitutional limits on uh, what's going on here? And I think that the good news is that at one level, what, what's happening is not a completely new phenomena. And you had, uh, the framers were concerned. I mean, the framers had, you know, not just King John, but subsequent kings who did a number of unfair things, including unfair fines against uh, individuals who weren't in favor with the crown at any one particular time. And so provisions going back to the Magna Carta did provide protection against excessive fines by the government. And that's enshrined right in the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. And that's a provision that, you know, for the most part, sort of sat there relatively unrecognized and unlitigated um, until relatively recently. But the Supreme Court has really breathed new life into the excessive fines clause. And I think as long as people can figure out a way to get into court and test some of these practices, I think the excessive fines clause will probably be part of the solution here. I do want to emphasize, though, that although in some ways these phenomena are not new, they are, I think we're seeing something different here. And part of it is what Andy alluded to with the swarm. Part of it is just this kind of sense, I think, in Washington, which is the only way for an enforcement agency to get headlines is to announce that they have a new record fine. And some of the fines we're seeing are really just st in staggering amounts. And you know, some of those are in context where maybe you would expect to see a reasonably robust fine. But what I think you start to see now is that other agencies that used to be traditionally sleepier agencies, they're looking at all the headlines that other agencies are getting. And all of a sudden, they're making demands in the context of their enforcement authority that are completely unprecedented in the context of these agencies. And I guess the one thing that gives me a little bit of, of hope, especially uh, in some of these cases, if you can figure out the right way to litigate it, is the same thing that drives some of these press releases on the part of the government enforcement agencies, the fact that it's a record fine. Um, you know, in a way, if you got into court, that would be I think something you would put in, you know, in, in, in highlight, in, in headlines, because that does show that there is at least the degree 
of what's going on here is, is unprecedented, and I think that will, uh, I think eventually, if these cases are litigated, provide a little bit of a check on this process. Well, I, I would also add that certainly Congress does not help when they are calling on a bipartisan basis for more enforcement, more accountability, and it really does play to this populist mentality. It's certainly a factor that ought to be considered. But the other factor I want to talk about is the use of these, these monies, the, the fines, at the state and at the federal level. ILR had issued research on this as we styled as enforcement slush funds, and, and it certainly seems to be very prevalent at the federal level, but also at the state level, and tied in, uh, Victor, with what you've been saying. But um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, what's, what's happening to this money. Is it going to the federal fisc, or is there more of a trend you mean the to, state yeah, level? Yeah, to, to start state buying level, key chains and uh, state body level, armor. the money is used by some attorney generals for their own pet charities, and then they campaign that they helped that charity, their own law schools, and then they have a lectureship named after them. And I, Churchill talked about the soft underbelly of the axis. For UDAPs, unfair competition practice, unfair deceptive and Competition Practices Act, that's the soft underbelly. That's where the media will empathize with us. They may not on penalties, and they may not on other rules, but the fact that state officials are using money that could go to the general fund to build schools, to build roads, to do things for the people, are being used for a personal purpose, that is where you strike. And the chamber has done great work in bringing this out because People didn't know about it. Uh, and the more we publicize that, the more we are going to be able to reform these laws. Because nobody wants an attorney general to be using money for his or her personal purposes. That just doesn't fly in liberal or conservative. We've got to stop it. But it's true on the federal level as well. I mean, what's, what's surprising is if you look at some of these, the massive uh, settlements that, that Paul was referring to, so either some of the money directly or the, the settling bank in many cases has the option of instead of paying money to the government to pay money to some favored private groups that have been identified by the Justice Department or a prosecutor. And it's not just in these agreements, it's, it's, it's been a surprisingly long tradition to essentially use settlement money as a private grant program for a U.S. attorney uh, or for the Justice Department, so pretty shocking. And again, going back to what the framers thought, they would have been shocked to think that government money could essentially be appropriated and spent by an executive branch official in the guise of enforcement actions. The second concerning thing is even when the gov money doesn't go to private parties, there are a number of things that Congress has either blessed explicitly or allowed that allow the Justice Department and other agencies to use the money for their own purposes. It doesn't go into the general treasury to reduce the deficit or whatever. It goes into a fund in the Justice Department, for example. There's a rule that says 3% of every recovery goes to the office within the Justice Department that recovers the money. So if you're a US attorney and you need new copiers or computers or whatever, great, find a deep pocket, pressure them to settle, get some money and you get 3% off the top. And you know we think that our enforcement, the reason government enforcement is different than trial lawyers, but should be that government enforcement decisions are being made based on the public interest exclusively. Uh, and in fact, as the research that Harold talked about, uh, you know, in the 19th century, there were customs officials and tax collectors who got paid based on a percentage of what they collected, and Congress got rid of that because they thought, gee, this actually gives bad incentives. But we're sort of moving back right into that, uh, that problem. Well, there seems to be a growing interest in Congress, especially in terms of their own legislative powers under Article I to legislate and appropriate, which seems to be in tension with what the executive branch is doing. Uh, there is some interest in Congress to, to examine this from, a, from an oversight perspective. I'm wondering, Andy, if you can talk to us a little bit about what's happening up on the Hill. Well, both in terms of uh, oversight hearings, uh, where the new attorney general is, is going to testify, and one of the topics identified uh, by the Chairman Goodlatte was this question of, of money that is uh, obtained in settlements and what, what is done with it. 
and uh, a legislative proposal from the chairman that also would prohibit uh, this sort of private grant program uh, to third party, to, to private parties uh, by enforcement officials. So I think there is a lot of interest uh, because I do think people on the Hill see it as, as a sort of very uh, surprising arrogation of power to the executive branch and to individuals actually. Well, I would just note that the oversight hearing is in the House Judiciary Committee tomorrow, I believe at 10 a.m. in the House Rayburn Office Building, and certainly worth watching. Uh, and in addition, um, something that uh, where you can get more and more interest from members can can really uh, elevate this issue, which is which is something that seems to be growing and ever concerning. Paul, I'm wondering. Speaking of the tensions between the various branches of government in terms of how the executive branch is really doing a function of the legislative branch, are there some constitutional issues there that warrant at least some, some scrutiny and some consideration by the courts? Well, there, there certainly are a lot of constitutional issues that arise here, and one of the ones that I think Andy was alluding to is, you know, there's an old due process case of the Supreme Court uh, that involved the city mayor who, you know, basically sat as judge and jury and then basically ran the town based on the budget that he was able to assemble by imposing fines on people. And the Supreme Court of the United States said, well, that's, you know, an obvious due process problem because you don't, as, as Andy alluded to, you don't want the sort of scales of justice to be tipped in one way or another because the government gets a take uh, of the proceeds, and I think that's, that's one very real way in which the due process clause almost reinforces separation of powers principles by saying that these, these incentives for the, uh, the, the people who are supposed to be impartially applying the law, they get skewed in a fundamental way if they're essentially funding their own agencies on that. You know, as to the, as to the congressional oversight, I think you know, here's a real opportunity to sort of use the separation of powers uh, in, in a proactive way that doesn't really involve the courts, which is you know, there is this sense, and Harold, you alluded to it, that the, the, the Congress on some of this has aided and abetted this idea, this populist strain, and this idea that record fines and massive enforcement is a good thing. But I do think when it starts to interfere with their oversight function, that's one place where they can see things a little differently. And so I do think emphasizing that uh, one, one counter uh, effect of allowing these agencies to use these enforcement funds uh, to fund their own agencies is it really undermines Congress's ability to use its oversight authority robustly. And also its appropriations authority, because in a time of fiscal constraint, if the Justice Department has its, its own kitty that it gets to keep, the fact that there's an across the board five or seven or 10 percent cut uh, means the Justice Department really isn't paying its full share compared to other agencies, but that's been sort of taken away from congressional oversight at all. Well, Professor Schwartz, just getting back to you on the state UDAP laws and the enforcement by the state AGs, uh, we often hear a lot about enforcement activity against pharmaceutical companies regarding off-label marketing claims. Uh, certainly something at the federal level which has triggered a lot of federal False Claims Act litigation, but I understand uh, that state UDAP laws are now being applied as an enforcement tool to address the marketing practices by branded or generic uh, pharmaceutical companies. Can you talk to us a little bit about how these theories of liability are being crafted under these state statutes? Each attorney general will construe it in his or her own way. Uh, the marketing of off-label uses is a complex area, but in a way it's simple. Uh, we discover over time that there may be a bit, another use for a drug. It's used for heart disease, but it may be able to be used for another illness. The state attorney generals have gone beyond what the federal government wants to do in not allowing a person who represents a drug company to simply tell the truth. This is what we have learned. Here is a study that we have done. And the fines can be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The settlements are above the roof. A couple of decisions came down in the past year that may be of some help because these decisions suggested 
that the actions by states are impeding free speech, First Amendment rights. So once that happened, the FDA said, whoa, we better go back and take a look at it. So while the FDA is taking a look at where the line should be drawn, some state attorney generals say, well, we don't care. It's like the federal government is a foreign government to some of these state uh, attorney generals. They ignore it. And they still are threatening uh, drug companies with what is basically truthful speech. We're not talking about hucksterism, this can cure this or this can cure, cure that. The speech has to be absolutely truthful. And more spotlight on this, more editorials about this would be very helpful. The FDA said in April that they would come out with new rules. Well, these things take a while. Um, they still have not. They were going to hold a meeting. It's hard to get a meeting together. Uh, I mean, you do it once a year. Uh, so they haven't been able to do that. But I think that the rules on off-label use are going to be more constructively developed so they will be the in, in the interest of the ordinary citizen. And that's what we want. Uh, if a drug can do something new and it's all truthful, doctors should know about it. Final thing, a doctor can ask a question of a drug representative and he or she can answer it. But the drug representative cannot tell the doctor what it is unless he's asked. And you can imagine what legal disputes can arise about who asked who. Well, Paul, in your paper, you point out some potential constitutional argu arguments that could be raised against the level of enforcement activity here. Now, if I'm a general counsel with a company, though, and I'm on a, the receiving end of a, an investigation or possibly exclusion or debarment, depending on the industry that you're in, uh, am I going to have the gumption to challenge a particular theory of enforcement that an agency, whether at the federal or even at the state level for that matter, uh, in court? Am I, am I going to do that? Am I going to run that risk? Um, and if so, are there any solutions potentially to try and deal with this at, at least at the federal level? Well, that really is where the rub lies in all of this, because the good news is that if you actually get into court, there are a number of constitutional provisions that potentially can limit uh, what, the, what, what the federal government is doing. And in addition to the constitutional arguments, there are also good arguments to interpret the statutes that give the agency authority in a way that puts sensible limits on the authority. I think one of the best ways that the excessive fines clause ultimately can be used in court if you get there is to interpret vague terms in a statute in ways that limit the ability of the government agencies to just run up the number of fines. I mean, you see this at both the federal and state level. I mean, uh, Victor mentioned the, uh, the context of these state prosecutions under unfair uh, trade practices or unfair practices. And part of the problem there is that typically run about 5,000 per violation. But the law doesn't tell you anything about what's a violation. And so it puts the state AG, or if they go to court, potentially even a jury, in this position to really just come up with anything. So if it's, if it's an if it's, if it's off-label marketing case, uh, there's nothing that really stops a state from saying, well, every, every package that was sold um, is an independent violation that gives rise to a $5,000 per violation fine. And I think the excessive fines clause can be uh, very useful in interpreting statutes to say, no, you, you can't interpret the statute to make there be so many fines or to give the prosecutor so much discretion. But how do you get to court? And if you are that general counsel and you're facing the agency and the agency, by virtue just the very fact of litigating this, is going to cause a lot of bad publicity and it's also going to create uncertainty about what the scope of liability is. And there obviously are profound business reasons to want to get closure. Mm -hmm. And closure typically means agreeing to uh, the government enforcement de demands no matter how ridiculous. Um, and so I think that that's really the good news, bad news. If you can get to court, there are real tools available, but it's very hard to figure out how you get to court. Now, I think I draw sort of two lessons from this. One is that there, there, 
I think, I think people need to think long and hard about whether, particularly if they're facing an issue where they don't think the publicity would be that terrible. I mean, there's some real benefit to being willing to take some of these issues to court. And I do think that thinking strategically about that is really worth doing. But then I think the second thing is maybe in the longer run, uh, it really is worth thinking about whether we want to make some effort at some kind of either legislative uh, reform, it probably would take legislation, but to get an opportunity to test the government's theory at an earlier stage in, the, in these proceedings. Because I think that would be incredibly useful as putting a check on the government. It would lead to more judicial decisions that would interpret these statutes and put limits on these statutes. And the other thing, quite frankly, is I think it would be a hard thing for the other side to argue against. I mean, you know, these are difficult issues because you, you almost don't run into this unless you're accused of doing something that sounds like a problem to someone. And, you know, to getting in that public debate is hard. But it's pretty hard to argue against an early opportunity before a completely impartial decision maker to test whether there's anything to the government theory. Yeah. Well, it seems like that type of model could equally apply at the state level, depending on any particular state attorneys general, but specifically the, F the FTC uh, has cease and desist orders. There's procedures that could be established at the state level. Right now, the reason there isn't a lot of law, and we've been looking into this for a while, about unfair and deceptive practices act at the state level, is that companies settle, Harold. They settle because they have unlimited liability exposure. And so they, out of reasonable apprehension, they settle. So you don't have rules. It isn't like other areas of law where you can find a rule of law, you can find a precedent. It just isn't there because the AGs have this enormous power of unlimited uh, liability against a company. Well, Andy, at the federal level, uh, Paul sp spoke a little bit about some of the potential solutions from a litigation perspective, assuming that you can get in early at the inception of an investigation. Do you have any other thoughts in terms of potential reforms that could be pursued to address the, the widespread regulators gone rogue problem here in Washington? Well, I, I think for some of the abuses, there are possible congressional solutions. I mean, the, the administrative law judge home court advantage game is, is certainly one where Congress could step in and, and level the playing field, and that's obviously not restricted to the SEC. It's true of many agencies. Um, you know, I think it's interesting because the Justice Department and the SEC have been very focused on sort of corporate compliance and corporate whistleblowers. But the government really is not very open to people blowing the whistle on abuse by prosecutors uh, in a way that doesn't open the whistleblower to really incredible uh, retaliation. And I think one thing the government has to look at, uh, and you said it, if you step back and look at the power that prosecutors have, whether they're criminal prosecutors, civil people in the Justice Department or people in agencies. It, it's really a huge amount of unreviewable discretion that we don't tolerate really in any other area of the government. There are checks and balances. And I think we need to find some ways to put some checks and balances on this power, either within the departments or some external watchdog that people can go to, not after a case is over, uh, but while a case is going on, to say, you know, I've got a prosecutor who's, who's rogue. And uh, I need some help here. And uh, I, I think some structure that allows that to happen, paired with Paul's idea of a way to get into court, at least begins to create some checks and balances that we just don't have right now. Well, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here, talk about current events. Uh, just last September, I believe, the Deputy Attorney General Sally Yates issued a memorandum, the so-called Yates Memorandum or Yates Memo, which really puts another veneer and a focus on prioritizing investigations against corporate executives for perceived wrongdoing by corporations. Uh, it seems to definitely have captured the attention of those in the compliance world as well as in C-suites all throughout the country. And I'm wondering if you all could at least provide some insights in terms of where you think that this potentially could lead in the next six months to the next few years and what this means for 
compliance programs across the board to internal investigations and generally for the entire future of corporate criminal liability. Maybe I'll start with you, Andy. Well, I, I think one of the mistakes that the government has made in the last five or seven years is to basically give companies no credit for internal investigations. I think if you're a company these days and you're dealing with the SEC, for example, it's sort of foolish to do an internal investigation because they want you to turn it over, strip it of privilege, and you're probably going to not get much credit for it anyway. I think this is probably another way to try and, and draw a wedge between companies and, and individuals. Uh, and I think that's concerning, and I think we may, although the chamber did some great work on protecting attorney-client privilege, we may see that. I, I guess I'd step back and say what, what, I see it as a real missed opportunity, and Victor talked about cease and desist orders. We, we have a phobia in this country, when something goes wrong, we have to find somebody who's to blame and punish them. In a lot of these situations, the law was unclear, people may have done something, that in retrospect seems bad or had bad consequences, but was it illegal under the fair notice requirements of the Constitution? Probably not. A and I just, I think it's a real missed opportunity to say that the department would focus not on this retributive, you know, we're gonna get scalps, but we're gonna try and come up with mechanisms so that people going forward, we can clarify the rules, people will stop doing things that turn out to be wrong and know the rules of the road going forward, and that seems totally absent. Professor, do you have any thoughts about the Yates memo? The, the lawyer-client privilege. I mean, it, it is, throws a monkey wrench into it within a corporation. If you're working for a corporation and then all of a sudden you're being targeted, all the memos that may be internal, uh, let's say it's a, a council uh, and they're going after that person, uh, what ha are they privileged? How can one communicate without a possible conspiracy charge being brought against a company where they're trying to protect their own employee. Uh, these two gentlemen are more expert in the criminal law than I am, but that, as somebody who taught and practiced the law, evidence law, that uh, privilege part uh, is a beam that says problems in the future. Well, do you foresee heaven forbid that the state AGs take a similar type of approach in terms of their enforcement priorities now that the federal government has done it, is there potentially op opportunities for them as well? They're good learners. I mean, one of the things that we've seen in trends in the past 10 years that uh, concern me, and you all saw it right from the beginning, is laws that are passed at the federal level now often empower state AGs to enforce those laws. So you get this triple whammy effect. You have A, the uh, federal government. B, the trial lawyers bring suit. Three, the state attorney generals. And where they're empowered by federal law to do things, they are looking more to the federal government as a source for new opportunities. So uh, too many words to just say yes. And Harold, I would just add on this. You know, I'm not sure this Yates memo approach is really going to work. Um, because I actually think part of the way that uh, federal enforcement officials in particular have been able to generate uh, these enormous record fines is precisely as part of an ultimate bargain with the corporation that where the liability, the criminal liability of individuals is threatened but then as part of a global solution, of course, it's taken off the table, and that means that there's you know, a couple extra you know, million dollars in the kitty for the, you know, assistant U for the U.S. attorney or the head of the enforcement agent to trumpet in their, in their press conference. And I think what's happened is people who, you know, sort of on the, the kind of populist left, have looked at the enforcement record of this administration and they've said, you know, after sort of almost eight years now of record penalties and record fines, they're kind of saying, well, guys, where's the beef? You know, these fines are nice, but like, you know, show me your scalps. And I think the Yates memo is a reaction to that. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's an earnest expression of perhaps there will now be scalps. And I, I understand why, you know, if you're, if, if you're in a C-suite, that's an alarming proposition. But I'm just not sure how this works, because I think that you know, if they really are serious about demanding individual prosecutions, then you know, I mean, you know, people, you know, it's one thing to settle a case for $100 million. It doesn't make a lot of sense to settle a case 
if you're going to go to federal prison. And you know, so ultimately, this could be the mechanism that actually causes some of these government theories to be tested a little bit. Now, that is, if they're actually serious about this, I, I kind of feel like you know, this may just be a bluff, because otherwise I, I think this may end up being a case of the, of, of, of the dog who finally caught the car. Yeah. Well, as we get input from practitioners and others about this Yates memo, one of the troubling features in the memo is that it really requires the investigators and the internal compliance investigation piece of it to turn over every relevant fact. And it's really in the eyes of the beholder as to what that exactly means and the impact it could potentially have on investigations, internal investigations. Uh, what does it mean for voluntary disclosures? And so these are all the very nascent issues that are, that are sort of bubbling up and something that I think warrants some consideration, at least from, from the perspective of the immediate impact. I'm wondering if you could comment on that, if that's something that you're, you've thought of, Andy. Well, I, I, I think that's right. And as I said, I, I think the government, you know, talks out of both sides of its mouth with respect to both compliance and internal investigations. You know, it wants internal investigations, but it's increasingly reluctant to give any credit for them, uh, even if they're the most thorough independent investigations that you can imagine. Um, it wants uh, people turned over, but it also, as Paul says, wants the big money. And, and so I think there's a, there's a real inconsistency of, uh, in terms of what their expectations are, and they're going to have to figure out uh, what they want to some extent because what they're asking is internally inconsistent. Well, on the brighter side of things, I suppose, in July of this year, the fraud section at the Department of Justice established a new position called the Compliance Council, and something that we had approached with some guarded optimism, given that this office or this position, which I understand has now been filled last month, will really focus on the quality of corporate compliance programs in the context of future criminal liability, and something that is separate and independent from a line prosecutor or from any of the U.S. attorney's offices throughout the country. And I'm wondering uh, how you view this position. Is it something that we should be encouraged by, or is it something that we should be somewhat skeptical about? You know, I it could be good. P part of the problem with any of these jobs is if, if your metric of success is how often do you criticize people, how often do you say, you know, this program isn't good enough, uh, then that sort of creates a cycle where this person's job is just to, you know, their version of scalps is to say we reviewed 50 corporate compliance programs and they were all terribly deficient and, you know, we've told them that they have to make these huge changes. If, if, it, if it's that, I don't think it's going to be particularly helpful. If it is actually some, uh, an entity that will, uh, in a rational way, look at compliance programs and maybe provide assistance to smaller companies that probably need it more, uh, that's great. And I guess the other thing I would say is, as I said before, if it's so great for companies, maybe it's also something the Justice Department needs for itself. It gives you also, a, uh, sorry, go ahead. It gives you a media hit. It, uh, the, it's news if the chamber is going to agree with something that the federal government has done. That's good news. And <laughs> drive it, because uh, it is common sense fairness. It's cab driver fairness that if a company does everything possible to ferret out foreign corrupt practices, does everything possible to stop uh, fraudulent activity, they should be awarded. It's carrots and sticks. We did a, in my life, uh, I couldn't, didn't get into Harvard, but I got into one of their journals. So if you live long enough, then something good can happen. Uh, and in that journal, we make the point uh, as well as we can that's right in that memo that if uh, the a company has set up a program that meets criteria A, B, C, and D, that prosecuting them for foreign corrupt practices is not really fair. They've done everything they can. And the same is true with false claims. If they, instead of having one of their employees run out to some lawyer to sue the own company, if there is an internal mechanism where there's no retribution against that employee, he or she should first go home and see if his problem can be solved. And you've been on the page of that for years. So I would use that as an opportunity 
to get the story out uh, about how you agree with it and then go a little further or push it in a way that you think really works. I think it's a real opportunity. Yeah, and I think it, you know, where the rubber meets the road is you know, what's the consequence for not having a deficient compliance program? I mean, you know, if that's the ticket for not allowing the government to even try to prove mens rea in a criminal prosecution, well then, you know, that's a great development. If the prize for not having a deficient compliance program is you don't get criticized for having a deficient compliance program, and that's it, uh, then I don't really see why there's, there's, there's much promise there. Yeah. Well, at ILR, we have been pressing for a, an affirmative defense for having good compliance programs, as certainly in the FCPA case, it's been viewed in other countries as a very important policy development in order to encourage more compliance, especially when it comes to anti-bribery regimes in the UK, Italy, and some of these other countries. And hopefully, this is a, this is a positive signal that uh, compliance is taken seriously by the department when it comes to some of these issues. Um, perhaps another sunnier note was uh, Assistant Attorney General Leslie Caldwell of the Criminal Division in the spring of this year spoke at a compliance conference up in New York, I believe, and she empath empathized with the concerns from the business community about the so-called regulatory pile-on or, or swarm, as, as you put it, Andy, where you have uh, a number of enforcement actors at the state level, across the federal agencies and internationally, coming in, chasing down you know, their piece of the pie for a single occurrence or a single type of conduct. Um, and in her remarks, she said that there is an acknowledgement that this is unfair and that we are working to try and address this. And I'm wondering if this is something that uh, that you find encouraging, or if you have any other insights you might be able to, to present here. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what, what's in her mind, but I think the fact that somebody in the Justice Department actually said this has, this is unfair and we need to think about it is a positive sign. And you know, hopefully uh, one of the ways that they'll think about it is to interact with ILR and the business community to sort of talk about the aspects of this problem and, and what some solutions might be. Uh, you know, it's hard. Even if the Justice Department wants to do something, it's hard for them to do it unilaterally uh, because the states are obviously independent actors. But they do have, at least at the federal level, the Justice Department in particular can often exercise some considerable moral suasion over other agencies to get them, uh, you know, on board with a single program. And maybe that's something that they'll uh, that they'll try and do. Paul or Victor, do you have? I any? think it creates that too creates a media opportunity. When I'm trying to explain this to just regular folks, you know, my cab driver friends. I said, if you have children and a, your kid has misbehaved and your wife or your husband has punished him during the day, you come home and you want to punish him too. That's unfair, they said. And that's exactly what goes on here. So finally, somebody who is in government has spoken about this. It is fundamentally unfair to be punishing somebody again and again for the same thing. Uh, but when the chamber says it or business groups say it, it's whining. But when the government has said it itself or a representative, then people might listen to it. And, and, and I guess the only thing I would add to this is, you know, it, it, it's a glimmer. And, but, you know, it, it, I guess my question is, you know, is this anything more than a federal enforcement officer sort of somewhat annoyed by this phenomenon of federalism? Uh, because if that's all it is, if all it is is a federal prosecutor saying, you know, it might actually be easier to get the companies to agree with us if we were the only people they had to deal with and they didn't have to deal with these states, I, I think, you know, in that context, you know, it, it, it's probably better than nothing. At least somebody's recognizing that there's something of a problem. But, you know, that's one area where, frankly, the federal constitution probably doesn't provide a lot of solace, because although it's a great argument to uh, a, a, a cab driver, uh, the Supreme Court has made pretty clear that you know, there is the sort of dual sovereign notion that uh, you know, the, the argument that there's a double jeopardy problem with being punished by two sovereigns for the exact same conduct is a thought that occurred to litigants quite early in the Republic. Um, and it was very unsuccessful in, tr in trying to litigate that. And there is, you know, and, and I think it, it actually, in the long run, I think it really behooves uh, people at the ILR, ILR and at other levels to think about this issue in a way 
that accommodates a legitimate role for the states um, and sort of doesn't put us sort of completely at crosshairs with or cross purposes with federalism arguments, but nonetheless makes, it makes, an, it makes an accommodation for it. I mean, I think there's a world of difference between having duplicative state activity when the conduct is distinctly targeted at that state. I mean, if there's a, if there's a corporation that's done something wrong and the state where they're located uh, wants to take a separate enforcement action or the state where the conduct is uniquely directed wants to take a separate enforcement action, I think talking about that differently from the much more common situation, whereas you know, some federal agency has taken action at some practice that is directed no differently to any one state than the other 49, and yet seven or eight of them express tremendous umbrage and outrage and then go after their own independent prosecution without anything that really even tethers it particularly to that state. I think kind of distinguishing between those two circumstances in making these arguments in the long run is going to make for a more effective and robust, more robust argument. It's a and nuance one, away. No, I'm sorry. It, it's a nuance away, but if a drug company is in compliance with a regulation of the Food and Drug Administration with a specific drug, with regard to its warnings and everything it has done, and then a state attorney general says, oh no, we want you to warn more, or you, one of your sales people said this or that, where the FDA has already dealt with it, I think then it should be a stop, that the state attorney general should not have the power to run around a federal agency that is specifically designated by statute as the exclusive regulatory body. Okay. I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I agree with Paul, and, and one answer back to Assistant Attorney General Caldwell is you could do a great service by getting the federal government's house in order and provide an example for the states about how they can organize themselves to eliminate duplication on each level. And to the extent justice could take the lead in doing that, that, that could be a great, a positive development. Okay. Well, gentlemen, we have 50 seconds, but I want to do a quick lightning round and talk about one example of regular, regulators going rogue, and that is the SEC's use of administrative tribunals to find liability for insider trading or other securities violations. In a word or two, your reaction, starting with you, Andy. We need legislation. Victor? <clears throat> the thing should be up to uh, a judge, not an agency, to make this kind of uh, condemnation. They shouldn't use their own people. It's like a landlord uh, using his own employee to decide whether a tenant has a right or not. That was more than two words. <laughs> That's right, but I, you've always given me latitude. Paul, I'll give you four, I think. Tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, I, I, th I think it's a, it's, it's a problem, but there are lots of substantive problems with the way that the SEC sees the securities laws as well. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your insights, for your time, and for the audience's attention to this panel. Appreciate you all being here.